Welcome back to Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we started out this morning talking about house rules. Not the TV show, House, but house rules, things to live by, what you do in your home, what you set yourself up for as a pattern for life as a believer. The Bible gives us strong examples, but if we're not familiar with some of the ways that we are called to walk out our believing life, then we're ill-equipped to be an ambassador on the earth for people to actually see the light that emanates from us. So today I'm going to take you on a journey through some rules, some suggestions, some guidelines for living as a believer. Number one, follow Messiah's example at all times. His greatest command was love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Even if someone treats you wrongly or whether you know them or not, we're called to love them. Yeshua said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He says in John 13, 15, I have given you an example that as I have done, so should you do. He had compassion on people, and he healed them. He knew that they were in sin, but yet he had compassion on them. He had a kind word, even at times a stern word. It was to uplift them, to encourage them, to stop what they were doing, to turn and be healed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, Imitate me as I imitate Messiah. In Ephesians 5, 1, he says, be imitators of God as dear children. In Matthew 12, 44, Jesus says, many believers are empty, swept, and garnished by lukewarm doctrines. If you just go to church, you'll be a weak believer, and trials will make havoc of your life. But if you go to church and read the word every night, you'll become a strong believer. Most believers do not read the Bible every day, so if all you do is go to church, you will be weak. A few growing passages are Proverbs 8, 17 to 21. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I traverse the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. Psalm 1.1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of, of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. Yes, he reads it, he meditates on it, he hides it. It becomes a part of the very fabric of his life. And because he does that, the word says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. perish. A simple admonition, a simple instruction to dine on the word of God, that we don't eat one meal a week and expect ourselves to be nourished and fed. We come away hungry just even six or eight hours later. Imagine if this is all you're doing on Sunday morning or on Friday night, is attending one service, putting a check mark in the box, and not spending that time with the Lord in His Word, then how hungry must you be? How starving must you be? Imagine your physical body and the condition it would be in if you only ate one meal a week, and it happened to be on Sunday morning, and you had to struggle through the rest of the week drawing on energy even your own body consuming itself because it's not being nourished. This is the way of the spirit. This is the way of the soul. If it is not being nourished on a regular basis, it will grow weak. Number two, acknowledge that you have faults, sins, and then repent. Change your attitude and pray. Realize that giving your life to the Lord is not simply one act, 
but the beginning of a lifelong commitment. Persistence and perseverance are continuing attitudes for engaging life. Don't be hard on yourself if and when you fail, but admit it, pick yourself up, trust in God, and move forward. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 6, 10, Therefore, if anyone is a Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Messiah Yeshua, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their treasures to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Messiah, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Messiah's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. This is the pattern that God has for us as we walk out our salvation, that anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. In the natural we know that the body you went to bed with is not the body you woke up with. That during the course of the night, your cells, some died and some were born. We know that your hair, some fell out and some were replaced. We know that the chemical structure of your body is changed during your time of sleep. You are making yourself new. The food that was in your system has now been digested. Your uh, water consumption has now been processed. And so we know that the body changes. You are not the same person you went to bed. Therefore, when you woke up this morning and you are in Messiah, you are a new creation. This is not a one-time event upon your acceptance of the Lord, but a daily event. We must recognize that. Number three, we must read and do what the Bible says. A stunning revelation. This is not the pick and choose translation. God gave us his word, and if we claim his word to be inspired, it to be the inerrant word of God, then we cannot just do what James tells us. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. In Matthew 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Bible also says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. From 2 Timothy 3.16. James writes in chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religious is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Number four, allow God to change you. As a follower of Messiah, you cannot change yourself. Only God can through his Son. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. If we don't know his decrees, if we don't know his laws, if we don't know his word, then how can we possibly apply this? Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.24, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. A true believer, when he comes to faith, will immediately notice an unavoidable change in sensitivity to his daily routine. They will begin to question their taste in movies, music, clothing, even their choice in friends. The Bible says, therefore, rid yourselves of everything impure and every expression of wickedness, and with a gentle spirit welcome the word planted in you that can save your souls, from James 1 and 21. These are simple rules. Fundamental. These rules I taught in discipleship classes. In order to be a disciple, a Talmudim, a student of God, a follower of the Messiah, there are certain principles that are at play and must be applied to your life. Are these hard and fast rules? They're not, but it's one for us to examine, a list to examine and measure ourselves against to see whether or not we are walking this walk. There are so many that talk it, but we see no fruit. We see no fruit in their lives, we see no fruit in their families, we see no fruit in their relationships. We see nothing of them which resembles a believer. You know, everybody's nice till you scratch them. And when you scratch them, the true nature comes out. Are they ones to forgive and be patient with a kind word on their tongue? Are they ones to get agitated, aggravated, and short-tempered? God understands in this rule number five that you will be persecuted for your beliefs. Do not allow others' attacks to weaken your faith. Have courage in your convictions and do well, but don't judge others. I see so many Facebook posts where somebody gives you a response that you didn't want, you weren't expecting, and it kind of sets you unnerved and there's a dialogue that begins and it becomes an argument and you're trying to defend your position because you feel you are attacked but the word does not justify that God will defend you God will vindicate you and rather than your own words and the vociferous outcry of how offended you are maybe just a piece of scripture would suffice in taming the word says a, a gentle word turns away wrath. And so we have to have courage in our convictions and do well, but don't judge others. Second Timothy 3 and 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Messiah will be persecuted. We have to be willing to count the cost. We have to be willing to step out knowing that in stepping out. And if you understand the cost of Jewish believers like myself who have gone on the radio, on the television, to expose our faces and our names to the world, this puts us under persecution in Israel and denies us the ability to return to Israel as a citizen. For we are denied citizenship in Israel because of our faith in Messiah. We had to be willing to count the cost in order to do what we were going to do. We had to be willing to know that we would be denied access, that we would be turned away. Now, I'm very, very welcome in Israel, but when I apply for citizenship, I will be denied. My name, my face, my faith is out there. And the government has said that Jews who accept Jesus or Messiah will not be welcome. That is a form of persecution, my friends. And I had to be willing to count the cost. And my fellow brothers who are Messianic rabbis or rabbis who are profess faith, or have become Jewish pastors, uh, Messianic pastors of congregations, had to be willing to count the cost. In Matthew 5, 10, and 12, it says, O oh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The next rule, you've heard me talk about prayer so much, is to set aside time for effective and meaningful prayer. Make intercession for people who do not pray enough for their own development. Children, cousins, friends, enemies, family. In Ephesians 1 and 16, Paul prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. 
I recommend you say that prayer. Ephesians 1, 16 to 23 for yourself every day for one year and God will open up your spirit and develop your understanding. It says, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Intercede on behalf that God might pour out a spirit of wisdom, enlightenment, revelation, and knowledge of God for all those in your family, all your friends. Pray that for them and begin to see the difference. The first difference you'll notice is in yourself. Then you will begin to notice difference in others. Our next rule, guideline caution, call it what you will, is to try to see the perspectives, the point of view of others, even if you personally disagree with them. Of course, an answered prayer for peace for your enemies and that they would become blessed as children of God would help both of you and them. But in Philippians 2, verses 1 4 through 4, therefore, if there is any consolation in Messiah, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done. I want to repeat that and emphasize the nothing. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. How can you know the interest of others if you do not engage them and listen to them? If you cannot listen quietly to their point of view, even though it may not be your point of view. I found that in conversation with people that do not share my point of view, that once I understand their point of view, it arms me and equips me that I might pray for them. God allows us to see things in others, not to judge them, but so that we would know how to pray for them. If God can trust you with that knowledge and with that understanding, then accept that mantle of intercession and not judgment not to stand against them and convince them of your own opinion, but to intercede on behalf of them before God. This is what we are called to do. And if God trusts you enough to let you see that in other people, their failures, their failings, their frailties, whatever it may be, it's a cause for you not to judge them, but to pray for them. God encourages us to be patient with people who do not, do not make you happy or even upset you. We work on trying to forgive those who may have hurt you. You must learn to love your enemies. God loves everyone and we need to also. Say farewell to selective loving. If you have a hard time loving your enemies, pray to God to provide understanding through a scripture. James 5, 7 through 12, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earth in the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. I encourage you to work and pray for others to the best of your abilities. To care for people who are in need, if they are sick or in pain, pray for them. And when they ask for help, James 2 and 16, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? This is one of those things Jesus talked about in his teachings. Giving does not always have to be financial, it can be in the form of perishables, clothing, and acts of service. I want to encourage you to treat each other as kindly as you would like to be treated. 
even simple acts of kindness like holding a door open for someone or good deeds that can help you feel less paranoid because then you feel that others should think well of you or, or of your testimony and Messiah. Galatians 13 to 15, for you brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. The word tells us to strive to live a quiet life. In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. Pride can imply that you are judging others falsely, and it's said to be the mother of all sins because pride resides in each one of us. The source of all sin is one's own selfishness. Greed, lust, hate for others, murder, theft, slander, gossip, all these things have to do with ourself, that we think highly of ourselves, that we know better what someone should do. We have all the answers. We are the ones who uh, seem to think so highly of ourselves, but let me remind you that before you think so highly of yourself, we are all made of dirt. It's a humbling thought that we are no better than the dust of the ground, no better than the tree that was made by that same dirt, no better than the birds or the animals, no better. We are equally created by God. And God encourages us to openly share the good news. Remember, living the believing life through your actions will show others that God must be working in your life. Always stand up for your beliefs, such as being conservative in good morals and liberal in giving your own goods, not being a Robin Hood or a welfare monger profiting off of poverty or a welfare cheat, but planting seeds in others towards Messiah by grace through faith, which always results in good deeds. They are a result of salvation and never a means to salvation. Revelation 2 the Lord says to the church at Ephesus, I've seen your good works, but this I have against you. Remember the heights you have fallen. You've forsaken your first love, the Holy Spirit. If we are spirit-led, if we are spirit-fed, if we are spirit-guided, we will serve the needs of others gladly. King David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than sit on the thrones of man. We're to serve one another. I know that some of you have a hard time with this concept. You think you're important, special, different, gifted. But I want to encourage you that all of us are created in the image of God. And that we should think not so highly of ourselves. That we have obtained something to lord it over others. This is a source of legalism. This is a source of bitterness. This is a source of strife. This is a source of anger. This is a source of derision and dissension between groups of people. If you're sitting in the pew and thinking that the pastor, uh, you could give a better message than him, then you are there with the wrong motives. For you are to go hungry. I remember being hungry. And I know that when I was hungry, Beanie Weenies was a gourmet meal. It was a delicacy. The flavors rich on my tongue if I hadn't eaten in a couple of days. But yet, if my stomach is full and I go to a restaurant and they serve me the finest cut of beef, the most luxurious potatoes, and I have no appetite, I will probably not give that restaurant a good review. But it wasn't the restaurant, it was me. I didn't come hungry. If you're not coming into the church or the synagogue hungry for the word of God, hungry to be filled up to overflowing and then carry that forth through the week of study and reading and spending time with the Lord, then you too are sitting in the judgment seat. And scripture tells us carefully, judge not lest you be judged by the same measure you judge another, you will be judged. I get emails every week from people asking me to comment on this person's teaching and that person's teaching, and I say I do not comment on other people's teachings. I have not commented on other people's teachings in my past. Why? Because I don't want to open myself up for that same judgment. 
I don't want to expose myself to the critical eye of those that I might have named and belittled. I have no idea what it is that they're saying that bothered this person, but as a pastor, as a minister, as a rabbi of a congregation, I was required to write a prescription for my congregation. It was not necessarily for the masses. It was for those people, as a doctor sees a patient and writes a prescription, that prescription is not the same medication for every person. As a matter of fact, some people may have a negative reaction to that medication because of some type of allergy, or it may not agree with other medications they're taking. The pastor in the pulpit is the prophet of the congregation. And God will reveal to that prophet what he so desires to write a prescription in the form of a message, a sermon for those people. These are not all universal truths and apply to not all situations. So as you sit back and you are critical of other people's teachings, maybe that teaching was not for you. Maybe that was not addressed for you. That, maybe that was not your need. Maybe you were not hungry at the time that you heard that message and therefore it was not satisfying to you. The word encourages us to make special efforts to fellowship with other believers. It's a wonderful thing that God wants believers to unite in church and Bible study evenings. So don't think of others as hypocrites or hold yourself out an example. Give the credit for any good that you may do to God and to God's blessing. You'll find it a blessing to talk with Bible study members about believers' life, but not sensationalism like argumentative opinions or doctrinal discords about this is the only way, or this is the better way, or this is the right way, or you're doing this the wrong way. That's not fellowship, that's judgment. That's you demonstrating how much knowledge that you have, how much wisdom that you have, how much more learned you have. It's done out of pride and not out of love. Now, we're called to become accountable, being open to share our views or any misgivings and weaknesses. We're called to be transparent as believers, to have accountability partners. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There's an old adage, practice what you preach we often see that people who are Bible knowledgeable or lead a Bible study class seem to think of themselves as above and not as a humble sermon. But Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. We're to examine ourselves and our condition before we begin judging another and telling them what's wrong. Or approaching them and telling them what you've seen and what you've observed. We are to consider ourselves as a living example of the Messiah. We must practice what we preach. If we preach humility, we must demonstrate humility. If we preach forgiveness, we must be forgiving. If we preach reconciliation, we must be ambassadors of reconciliation. We must practice what we preach. Our message should be more obvious by our actions than they are by our words. We are called to help people, and volunteering is a great place to start. For a believer who is sure or unsure what God wants them to do. For example, you can take a shift at a homeless shelter or visit people staying in a nursing home. Acts of service. We must not rob God, but serve faithfully with our time, our tithe, and our talents. I know many of you grow weary in church. You have a short attention span. So I encourage you, maybe take notes. It'll help you focus on the sermon. Before you go to that service, make sure you're not playing on your phone or doing anything to keep you distracted. Your day with the Lord should be set up as a day with the Lord. Now on the Hebrew calendar, we look at the day at sundown to sundown. So the evening of Shabbat is a time of a family meal together. That can be replicated on Sunday morning as you have breakfast together, go to church, go to lunch together, spend the day at the park. 
as opposed to using it a day for shopping and running errands and for the things that truly you could do after work during the week, but you set aside Sunday to go do those things. But I want to encourage you that God wants you to set aside time for him. Set aside time with him. He's not asking you to do more for him. He's asking you to do more with him. You know, a lot of people are very legalistic about what you should watch and what you should do. And, of course, television has a lot of trappings, but you have to have a certain amount of censorship in your home. It is through the eye gates and the ear gates that we receive information. And it's very hard because men are visual. God wants you to have a pure mind, and he wants you to renew the mind with the word of God. It's hard to live a righteous life when the enemy keeps whispering in your ear, reminding you of your past, because it's only the enemy that reminds you of your past. It's God that reminds you of your future. So when you start hearing that voice who's messing with your head, who's talking to you about your past, pray. Take authority in the name of Messiah, Satan, be removed from me. Get behind me. And God will answer your prayers in Jesus' name because he's given you power and authority to do that. We know that the only way into heaven is to accept Messiah in your heart and believe that he's the only one that died on the cross for your sins, to believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord. That's a decision we all have to make. And if you have not made that decision, I want to encourage you to do so. Listen, God doesn't answer prayers on the basis of how good you are. He has a plan for everyone, down to the tiniest details. So sometimes you'll ask for something and he'll say no, even if it's a perfectly righteous request. God loves when you talk to him and he takes prayers into constant consideration into his master plan. So live a faithful life and trust that. Trust that he'll take care of everything. He created you. He has a plan for you. And he requires only that you trust him. You know, I see so many kids playing with their video games. Video games steeped in murder under the covering of war or monsters. They become desensitized to blood and guts and shooting blood and squirting blood and all these things. And they become conditioned to that. So that when they see these vivid images on television, they're not stirred or bothered by them because they've been seeing them and they're preconditioned on their games to allow this completely interactive. When we were kids and played cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, there was no bloodshed. We weren't using real arrows, they were rubber tipped. We weren't using bullets, we were using caps. We played hard, but it did not drive us to murder. Often people ask me if they can pray to God to change someone. Well, that's as if you were God. And you go to God with your petition that you want that person to be more your way than his way. Now, you can't repent for someone else. You can ask God to help someone to repent, but the person has to repent. She has to bear her own cross, and only she can or he can submit it to it. You can pray for the Holy Spirit to guide and assist, of course. You can intercede on behalf of those that are not saved, but you cannot repent for them. And thinking that you can manipulate God or manipulate them is a form of witchcraft. Manipulation is a form of witchcraft using things to motivate others is nothing more than casting a spell on them, moving them towards your way as opposed to an open dialogue is manipulation. We've all seen this that someone will say that they're a believer, may even teach a Bible study, but yet you see them in action and their actions do not. The way they treat their wife, the way they treat their children, the way they treat others in business. But yet, honestly, 
none of us are perfect. We all walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. We all stumble. The goal is not to fall. The goal is to be surrounded by people who are like-minded. It says, can two walk together lest they walk in agreement? You can live this life. You can pray to God and ask him to renew your heart every day and give you strength. You can go to the movies. You can do all kinds of things. But if they become little gods to you, if they become what consumes your mind, if they become the idols of your life, then you've taken your eyes off the Lord. And technology is one of the biggest distractions we have in our lives, and we spend more time with it than we do in prayer. We spend more time with it than we do with the Lord. It should not be so. An idol is anything you give more attention to than you give God. If God says there shall be no other gods before me. These are just some guidelines I want to share with you as we enter into this day of rest, as we wrap up our week's programming schedule. I want to leave you with some food for thought as you go this Sunday morning to church that maybe, just maybe, you'll go a little spiritually hungry and you'll let the Word of God permeate you, marinate you, and soften you to prepare yourself to be with others in the coming week. We'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> 